so it's time for session two, which is on transit agency and authority perspectives. Uh, it will be moderated by Tim Sassin, who is the market development manager US for battle powered systems. So I just give a brief introduction about Tim before I'll hand it over to him to start session two. So Tim started work with Ballard over 20 years ago, leading the engine control software development team for the Mercedes fuel cell buses that would be deployed across seven European cities. So Tim, without much further ado, over to you for session two. All right, thank you very much. Uh, excited to be here. This is going to be a fantastic panel. You know, Ballard's been doing zero emission buses for about 20 years and it's transitioned from vision to reality. These agencies are really in the midst of that zero emission transition. And these are the, the doers and the stakeholders that know the most. And I'm really excited to, to help facilitate this panel. I'll tell you who each of these people are real quickly. I'll give them a more detailed introduction as each one comes on in alphabetical order. And uh, please do put your questions in. Please put them into the Q&A as opposed to the chat. And uh, we'll have a great discussion following a brief presentation by each of these esteemed presenters. Uh, we'll have Michael Booth here. He is the capital projects developer at Indigo. We'll hear from Lucinia Ibera. She is the Proterra Yard Modernization Project Lead and Co-Chair of the Zero Emission Fleets and Facilities Technical Advisory Committee for San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. We'll hear from Earl Lewis Jr., Deputy Secretary at Maryland Department of Transportation. And we'll finish up with Jesus Montez, the Senior Executive Officer for Vehicle Acquisition at Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, or LA Metro. So let's start off with Mr. Michael Booth. Uh, he is AICP Certified Planner uh, at Indigo. He is Capital Projects Director, leading the team design, permitting, funding, construction, and expansion of the first battery electric bus-to-bus -bus rapid transit system in Indianapolis. The first corridor of the BRT, the red line, is 13 and a half miles long with 28 stations. Two other corridors will also be constructed by 2026 of 15 miles and 24 miles. Michael and Project and Program Management has worked on transportation and transit projects across the U.S. from Seattle, Washington, Chicago to Northwest Indiana and Indianapolis. He has over 35 years of project management, environmental, and federal funding experience delivering more than $12.6 billion U.S. worth of capital projects. Michael's successfully taken projects from concept through design to construction and service for Sound Transit, WSDOT, Chicago Transit Authority, NICTD, and now Indigo. Without further ado, Mr. Booth. Uh, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Is my volume good on the microphone? I just want to make sure. So, okay, good, great. Uh, sometimes I, I talk a little softly, so if I start to fade away, uh, Someone let me know, raise your hand, let me know if I'm not really talking too loud. So uh, basically on the Indigo program, we do have over 210 vehicles in our fleet and we have 31 battery electric buses and the BYD buses. And we uh, jumped fully into battery electric buses um, with our BRT system in Indianapolis. So we did have quite the learning curve though, um, as we started out with the buses, the BYD buses did have some early initial problems um, from the Altoona testing and then also just on the performance range. But BYD itself worked really closely with us to improve that and the buses are running well and we actually have shifted to end route charging, wireless charging that we will be having implemented and operational by the next few months or so. Um, so it's a lot of those pro programs and uh, problems that we have were taken care of. I also like to point out that BYD is unique in the fact that they have lithium ion phosphate batteries, which hold the charge longer through the cycle and um, have a little safety factor and also do not include um, cobalt or nickel um, materials in it, if I got that right. So it's more of an environmental friendly battery and it's something to look into. Um, overall, the bus, the bus for our BRT system is working well for us and we are expanding. Um, as we talked about, there's a couple of other lines that we're building out and I can get into more of that when we get in the round table discussion and some other lessons learned that we have about the buses and the actual construction of the BRT system itself. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. Uh, let's go now to Ms. Lucinia Iberi. Co-chair of Zero Emission Fleets and Facilities and Technical Advisory Committee at San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency. 
Placinia's campus planning manager at SFMTA and co-chair of their Zero Emission Fleet Facility Technolo Technical Advisory Committee. A project manager with over 15 years of experience in community development and urban planning, Lasinia specializes in strategic implementation of complex high dollar value projects and programs, including joint development and transportation facility capital planning. One of her major current work streams is planning for the transition of SFMTA's rubber tire facilities to support battery electric bus infrastructure, which is a delicate dance of logistics, phasing and interdependencies. Lasinia comes from an urban development background with a master's in planning from USC, bachelor's degree in urban studies from McAllister College, and a lifetime of lived experience in urban Bay Area neighborhoods. Lucinia, please take it away. Thanks, Tim. Um, so my perspective is very different from Michael's. Obviously, San Francisco and Indianapolis are quite different cities, um, but we're both sort of at the same, as all of us are here at the same sort of um, crucible for public transit on how to make this a zero emission transition. So um, as, as Tim said, my name is Lucinia Iberi. I'm leading the zero emission bus facility transition at the SFMTA. Um, a note for you all that my colleague, my colleague Bob and Katri is running the fleet transition at our agency and he's leading a session later today. His session is gonna go into detail on the zero emission program and uh, in particular on the fleet side. So the, for this particular panel discussion, I'm gonna focus on the SFMTA's approach to facilities. Um, our fleet engineering team really did the preliminary heavy lifting of selecting battery electric bus as our zero emission solution. We have about 900 rubber tire vehicles in our fleet. San Francisco's a uh, highly urbanized landscape and the neighborhoods in which our bus facilities lie also really support battery bus as the right solution for us. Um, as you know, as some of you probably know at least, the SFMTA has a pretty rich history of running zero emission vehicles as we've been running electric trolley buses for a significant part of our service um, since the late 1940s. On the facility side, prior to really understanding where we were headed with zero emission bus, we were beginning to form an ambitious capital program to replace several of our rubber tire maintenance facilities really in succession over the next 20 years, starting with the rebuild of Potrero Yard, which is a four and a half acre bus facility in a very urbanized mixed use neighborhood. The capital program began really before we understood that you know we were that there was going to be a state a state mandate for zero emission, and then also that was just like the the general um, trajectory of of uh, fleets. So San Francisco's history of clean fleets and our mobilized capital program really make adaptation to better electric bus sort of interesting in San Francisco because clean, clean vehicles give us a unique opportunity to really look at building multi-level bus facilities that include vertical integration of other uses, which is something that you know, other urban areas maybe don't have to consider because uh, just of the general availability of more land. Um, so we're looking at integration of housing, retail, and potentially other uses in addition to our bus maintenance and operations facilities. So while the facility conversion itself, and particularly integration of battery electric bus technology and infrastructure is highly technical, we're coming at it from a very much more of a community and economic development framework, asking really broad questions like, how can the SFMTA be a better neighbor as we transition to zero emission bus? Um, so we are in the procurement phase of the Potrero Yard project now using a public private partnership model to design, build, finance, operate and maintain various components of the Potrero Yard um, joint development program and bus yard. Hoping to commence construction in 2023 and as part of this, the development partner would be in charge of delivering a facility that's fully equipped from an infrastructure standpoint to serve 100% battery electric bus and we're looking at an ultimate capacity in this building of 213 buses and to include on day one a base capacity of a battery electric bus charging equipment to serve the number of buses that we will have in that facility at substantial completion. Um, an opportunity that arises in the P3 model is because it also includes ongoing maintenance, our development partner will be charged with transitioning the facility over time as we procure and add more battery electric buses to the yard. So um, this is how we're approaching at least the first of our major zero emission bus um, facility transitions. We'll seek to transition at least three of our bus facilities to battery electric bus in this way, adapting each project to the particular site and the needs of the fleet that, that ha is housed at that particular facility and apply applying the appropriate project financing scheme. But a big risk we're looking for solutions on, which I think I heard at the tail end of last session, is, is the general utility partnership as our utility partners aren't necessarily motivated by the same schedule goals and, and legislative mandates that we are. 
we're seeking a lot of power at each site and it isn't clear to us what will what it'll take necessarily to bring that amount of power to each one of our sites. And as we have to do each of our facility rebuilds in succession, because um, given our urban landscape, we don't have any redundant fleet capacity in our system. So utility delays on one site really have ripple effects throughout our program. Um, and one additional thing, we continue to look to diversify our funding and financing. While this P3 model that we're looking at brings longer range financing capacity into the picture, it's also really costly to consider doing this on multiple sites and sort of like compounding our obligation and our operating budget over time. And so we're seeking investment in pre-development and concept planning now to hopefully position the projects for state and federal funding programs as they become available. Um, and, and we will also likely, most likely be looking to San Francisco voters for new revenue measures. Um, so that's really, that's an intro on, on what we're doing for, for, for facility planning, at least. And like I said, uh, my colleague Bobin will talk more about fleet in the later session. Great. Thank you very much, Lucinia. Uh, let's go now to Mr. R. Earl Lewis, Jr. He is Deputy Secretary for Maryland Department of Transportation, uh, and he's got a very long and honored history I've collapsed his, his intro down a bit here, but, um, but Mr. Lewis is involved in a great many things. He was appointed on January 20th, 2016 to serve as Deputy Secretary on Policy Planning and Enterprise Services for the Maryland Department of Transportation. As Deputy Secretary, Earl oversees the administration of 12 offices within MDOT. He also chairs MDOT's Public-Private Partnership Steering Committee. Early on in MDOT, he led efforts to improve public safety communication systems at the county and state levels. Prior to his current appointment, Earl served from 2006 to 2015 on the MDOT MTA, where he served several roles, including Deputy Administrator for Operations and Deputy Chief of Safety and Emergency Preparedness. A veteran of state transportation senior management, he describes himself as a professional results-oriented leader with strong people skills who strives to get things done. Earl has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Virginia and an MBA and a second master's degree in information systems from the University of Maryland's Smith School of Business. Earl is a, a Baltimore native, as, as is his wife, Charlene. They have four adult children, Vaughn, Wesley, Christopher, and Kimberly, and they reside in Bel Air where Earl attends the Mountain Christian Church. His interests include gardening, travel, jazz music, and NFL football. Without further ado, Mr. Lewis, please take it away. Well, I don't know if anybody's ever read the whole thing, but thank you. <laughs> you could have collapsed it some more, but I'm glad to be here today. Uh, the Maryland Department of Transportation is committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and transitioning to zero emission vehicles is an important part of our agency-wide efforts. I'm pleased to be here today to share our approach and participate in this discussion. Dialogue and sharing lessons learned is absolutely critical as zero emission bus technology matures, and we are happy to be a part of that discussion and active. Uh, participant in this transition. Um, MDOT MTA uh, serves statewide M Maryland, but it's fixed route bu bus system, um, primarily focused on the Baltimore metropolitan area. Um, MTA is undertaking a transition of the core bus fleet propulsion to zero emission buses to meet the goals outlined in the state's 2030 Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act, um, and also the Central Maryland Regional Transit Plan. This entails putting about half of our 350 um, buses, uh, about 375 electric buses and to be transitioned to electric buses by 2030. So about half of our fleet. In addition, following the passage of Maryland Senate Bill 137 this year, all MDOT MTA new bus procurements beginning in 2023 need to be for zero emission buses. In order to plan for the transition, MDOT MTA has completed various analysis and studies to plan for successful transition while still providing world-class service to our customers many of whom are transit dependent. We've studied available technology and ranges, compatibility with our routes and facilities and costs. Um, MDOT has a ZEV working group where each transportation business unit of MDOT and MDOT is a multimodal transportation agency, which includes a highway agency, toll roads, bridges and tunnels, um, as well as um, operating airports and port facilities. Um, so we're looking at transitioning various fleets to meet MDOT's greenhouse gas reduction goals. Uh, Maryland also has a statewide Maryland Commission on Climate Change that's been in existence for over a decade, um, chaired by the Maryland Department of Environment Secretary. Part of the um, 2030 Greenhouse Gas Reduction Act that was passed about five years ago required Maryland to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions 
from 2006 levels by 40% by 2030. Um, that legislation was supported by, by both Governor Hogan here in Maryland, as well as the state legislature. So we, we're, we've got great support from the top for, our, for all of our initiatives. We continue to follow closely the experience with early pilot projects and development of battery electric bus and hydrogen fuel cell bus technologies around the country. We know the industry's learned quite a bit and seen some real challenges as the first buses have come online in the last few years. We actually were awarded a FTA low no grant in 2020 um, and, and also are using VW mitigation fund to launch our first electric bus pilot. That's gonna be at our Kirk bus division, MTA has four bus divisions. Um, it's gonna include um, five overhead chargers. Each uh, battery electric bus will operate in revenue service on multiple routes. The ZEV project management team will ensure a wide variety of bus operators, operations, and maintenance staff are exposed to the benefits and challenges of operating and servicing a battery electric bus. Um, then we're going to put together a detailed lesson learn document as we move toward the, the more wider deployment of battery electric buses at three of our four bus divisions between um, now and 2030. Our pilot, which will obviously the planning is already underway, but the bus will be delivered in 2022 will be about one and a half to two years. We know we need to hit all four seasons at a minimum to see how the buses perform in various types of weather and temperature conditions. Um, our seven bus pilot will include four 40 foot battery electric buses and three 60 foot battery electric buses um, using five overhead 150 kW Siemens chargers. Um, we're using new flyer buses, so we'll be using their performance software and also original um, equipment manufacturer charge management software. So we're very optimistic that battery electric bus technology is maturing and we'll be able to begin our transition successfully. We also continue to watch hydrogen fuel cell technology development and we're interested in that also. One of those three bus divisions really has the, 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 the safety configuration that would allow us to use fuel cell buses. And just to, to name those three bus divisions there, Kirk, Northwest and Eastern, North, Northwestern is the one that we may be able to use um, fuel cell buses at based on our technology decision process as we move forward. So that's my opening remarks and thanks. Glad to be here today. That's great. Thank you, Earl. Much appreciated. And now let's go to Jesus Montez. He's a senior executive officer for vehicle acquisition at LA Metro Transportation Authority. Asus is currently responsible for overseeing Metro's bus and rail vehicle capital projects, including Metro's transition of its CNG bus operations to zero emissions by 2030. He also oversees the vehicle engineering and warranty groups at and rail vehicle QA. Prior to joining Metro in 2011, Asus worked as a consultant for LTK Engineering Services for over 18 years. In that capacity, he supported the commissioning and delivery of Metro's P2550, P2000, P2020, and A650 order option fleets. Metrolink's commissioning and delivery of its Bombardier commuter cars and GM EMD locomotives and Amtrak's testing of its high speed train sets and high horsepower locomotives. Jesus is blessed with a wonderful wife and two teenage boys. Without further ado, over to you, Jesus. Thank you. We probably could have condensed that quite a bit too. Um, th uh, it's an honor to be part of this panel and, and uh, I look forward to, to uh, hearing from everyone else. So a little bit about LA Metro. We have a 2,400 bus fleet uh, and across the 10 divisions. Uh, back in uh, 2017, uh, the LA board um, directed us to begin the transition to zero emission service, transition from CNG to zero emission, asking us to do it by 2030. In parallel, uh, the California Air Resource Board as directed that we need transition by 2040. So we have a little bit more aggressive uh, timeline. When we started the process in 2017, uh, we knew very, very well that we were going into unguided territory. So we needed to develop a mission and principles to help guide us and ensure consistency in our decision-making. Uh, so the guiding principles that we came up with at the start was we absolutely, our, our, we consider our customers to be our patrons uh, who ride our system, uh, our operators who have to be in the in the in the their seats for eight hours a day, and our maintainers who have to maintain the equipment. So whatever we do has to satisfy um, uh, those three customers in addition to our taxpayers. So so our first guiding principle was we needed to improve service to our patrons. 
The second, contribute to the improvement of the regional air quality. The third, no matter what we did, we could not um, uh, impact our, our operation system. Whatever we do, we, we knew there was gonna be a huge transition. So we needed to make sure that whatever we did minimize any impact uh, to the work that our operators and maintainers were doing. Uh, and we needed to make sure that, that we pursued technically and physically sound approaches. Uh, there's a lot of people out there coming out with the latest and greatest as we get the bleeding edge, but we have limited resources. So we could not be out there at the bleeding edge. We needed to, to pursue things that had some level of, of service proven um, experience, maybe not in our explicit application, but in similar applications. Uh, since we started in 2017, uh, we've experienced a number of challenges and lessons learned. The top one is that uh, so there's still a tremendous amount of technical limitations out there with regard to vehicle range, battery capacity, and integration. Uh, the, the technology is evolving on both the vehicles and the chargers, but are not at the same pace. And so, and so there's constant integration issues between the two. Uh, so what we've needed to do because of, 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 of battery capacity and range limitations is we realized that we needed to match service to with uh, with bus performance, and there's different ways of doing that, and I'll discuss a little bit uh, that later on. Uh, we also needed to ensure that there's tremendous coordination between the the, the OEMs, the vehicles, and the charging equipment. Uh, they, they, we could not afford any finger pointing. We've already experienced issues, but because we ensured there was good coordination between the two we were able to resolve those integration issues uh, fairly quickly. The second set of challenges are with the divisions and both space and power. You know, we've heard other people talk about space, space, space. It is very, very, very true. And also um, uh, the, the amount of power that we need. In our first calculations, we, we estimated that we would need about 15 to 18 uh, megawatts of power at our divisions uh, support to, to match existing service. Uh, and uh, our divisions had anywhere from three to five. And so we take about three to five megawatts of power. That's a, that's a skyscraper. And so increasing that to 15 to 18, we're talking about adding enough power for, you know, three to five skyscrapers at each division. And that's, that's not trivial. Uh, so, so one of the, one of the mitigations there is we, needed to come up with charging strategies that lowered uh, that, that, uh, those peak demands to something more reasonable. Uh, and as part of our effort, we were able to, re at, at some of the first divisions we started looking at, we were able to reduce it from about 15, 18 to closer to 10 megawatts. And at the end of the day, that's going to uh, allow us to save money and save time in, 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 uh, as we convert those divisions. Um, the other other challenge is along lead times with with uh, procuring and installing equipment, specifically the charging the, the charging uh, equipment, and coordinating with the construction companies and utilities to get that done. Uh, a lot of us are just doing this for the first time. There's a lot of unanswered questions, a lot of risks, and it takes time to to uh, coordinate with the utilities, the construction 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 companies, to make sure that those risks are being addressed. Um, one of the challenges that we have right now, one of the divisions. Again, a space where, where are we going to put the new substations, uh, and uh, it's not on on metro owned property. So we're going through um, some challenges in getting access to you know in either buying land or or accessing land where we can put those substations. Um, funding, funding is is a challenge. You've estimated it's going to take about uh, two billion dollars for. Uh, the all for all the uh, battery electric buses that we need and about 1.6 billion dollars to convert our divisions that's 3.6 billion dollars total uh, more and more money is becoming available but the competition for it's becoming more fierce uh, and everyone's fighting for that and uh, so so uh, that's that's another challenge um, so what is our approach for the conversion so we developed a three phase approach. The first phase was uh, to convert our BRTs. We have two BRTs, the orange line, which is about 18 miles, and the, uh, the silver line, which is about uh, 38 miles. Uh, 
three, uh, phase one we chose because uh, we had opportunity to put in route chargers at both at, at certain points along the route, and that would allow us to mitigate the, the range challenges. Um, and uh, and so with regard to the, the, the orange line, which is 18 miles, we developed an approach working with New Flyer and BYD to be able to run continuously uh, on, uh, on that route with only end route chargers. So we put a, a total of eight end route chargers there, four at North, uh, North Hollywood, two in Canoga, and two in Chatsworth. Uh, we also added uh, two chargers at the depots, primarily for main, uh, maintenance uh, support, and we later added eight more uh, for, for local service. Uh, but essentially, the orange line is, is fully operational now. Uh, we have all 40 of the new Flyer 64 buses delivered. Uh, all our chargers are, are operational, and, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's a knowledge of service now. The silver line at 38 miles, our original intent was to do something similar, which we would operate only with en route chargers, but we realized that the battery capacity and range, uh, um, we, did not have, we did not have confidence that the buses that were going to be delivered had it. So we needed to uh, install depot chargers to support service. So throughout the day, the buses are going to be running out there, but at the end of the day, they would come in with the batteries almost fully depleted. So we would have to charge them overnight uh, so that they would be ready for the next day. So, so the, the approach there is a little bit different. Uh, so it did require, so we were able to get the orange line out first because we did not have to worry about depot chargers. The silver line, uh, we're about 30% design, uh, but we cannot roll it out until we install the depot chargers. So that's phase one. Phase two and three is uh, for, for our divisions. We, we grouped them in those divisions in which we had enough space to perform the conversion while maintaining CNG service. That's a phase two divisions. Phase three are those divisions where we did not have enough space to do the conversion uh, while maintaining CNG. So for those, we would have to shift service to other, other, other uh, divisions. Um, Again, uh, I've been hearing it over and over, you're gonna hear it from me, that, that space and power are, 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 are some of the two biggest challenges right up there with, with funding. Um, that's, we can get, I can get more into the weeds a little bit, uh, but that's essentially it. Uh, we can get more into the weeds during the question and answer session. Thank you. Fantastic. That was a great overview. Um, yeah, let's get into it and let's keep the conversation fluid and open. Uh, I've got a few questions to kind of start us out and we'll watch what comes in on the online Q&A as well. Um, one area that I'd like to start off with is, is really the bigger picture. Changing to a zero emissions fleet is more than just buying new buses way more than that. And we've heard about that. It has to do with the energy that you use for it. It has to do with real estate. It has to do with riders. It has to do with financing and funding. And I, I'd like to get a perspective um, from each of you, if I could, on those stakeholders and which stakeholders have really been the most impactful on your transition. Which have you heard the most from? Which have been the most demanding? Which have been the most participatory? And uh, I'll start with uh, Mr. Montez. Uh, Jess, can I call you Jess? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Yes. Uh, Jess, uh, what's your perspective on, on stakeholders and, and who's really been affecting your process? Uh, so far, everyone's been very, very supportive. The biggest challenge has, has been uh, with uh, um, putting in a substation at one of our facilities. That's been the biggest challenge. We've been fortunate that uh, the city of LA has been working with us to try to mitigate those issues uh, with, uh, with the landowner. And uh, so we, we've had a very good partnership with the city. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus because everyone has really been supportive. There's, there's policies, procedures, bureaucracies, and all that. Uh, but just working through that. In, in, the, in, the, pre, in the previous uh, presentation, the gentleman from the MTA noted that, that the bus group was getting to a new business. And they had to put together a new a new group to deal with uh, the government relations stuff, and, and that's exactly what we're going through. Also, we've had to establish new relationships with our government relations to help us manage 
the, the property element of, of the whole project. Um, so that's really been the the the, 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 the customer stakeholders that, that have been the most challenging only because uh, all of us are going into it brand new. Uh, but the good thing is that everyone is, is on the same page in recognizing that we got to do this and we got to do this together. But there's just everyone's a little bit risk adverse right now. Uh, the other one that, that's a close second is, is operations is, again, uh, we're going to be severely impacting the way we service the buses, the way we operate the buses, the way we the, the, the dance that takes place inside the divisions and all the movements that take place and just a tremendous amount of coordination that has to go through there. And so far, uh, we, we have good dialogue with them. Um, it, but it's but it's just um, everyone is worried about all the unknowns and doing this for the first time. Uh, did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, very, very good perspectives. Uh, Mr. Lewis, can I call you Earl? Yes, I go by Earl. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Earl, what, how does that match up with you? How are you dealing with, um, you know, outside land issues? Um, how are you dealing with the stakeholders that, that are affecting your process? I'll, I'll focus on three or four. Uh, obviously, um, one is going to be coordinating with the union and collective bargaining. Contract changes are going to be critical. Transitioning to zero emission buses will have significant impacts on the entirety of MTA's bus service workforce. Operators will need to relearn many driving habits um, from conventional vehicles and may need to follow adjusted schedules for vehicle recharging. Maintenance technicians will need to learn new practices for electric vehicles and will have expanded responsibility. So obviously that whole area has a lot of um, stakeholder related issues. Uh, another is our customers. As, as many of us know, uh, at least these, are, these early um, battery electric buses, the ranges are shorter than a traditional bus. So, you know, there's a federal requirement that you have a community process before you change schedules to let them know what changes you're making. And it, we really may have to look at, you know, a redesign of our bus network schedule, which has an impact on customers and obviously um, their lives and, and, and habits. And, and, and obviously it's important that the, the technology is reliable enough to meet the needs of transit dependent folks. Obviously there's a variety of environmental and health related stakeholders um, moving from a carbon-based fuel to non-carbon-based fuels will have a positive impact on, on health in the, in the areas where these buses operate, which is another positive we're looking at. But how we, how we measure the impact, because if you can't, ma ma you can't measure it, you, you can't manage it, you know, how we manage um, and measure the impact of the lower emission profile over time is something that we're gonna be working with our, our, our health and environmental stakeholders with. And obviously a, a really fourth one is the electric utilities. As, as Jesus mentioned, there's significant issues related to um, electric infrastructure to our bus depots and a significant invest, investment. If I was gonna name a fifth one, it'll be a federal government. So I think the, the, the partnership with them in terms of making funding available to help finance the higher cost of these buses, as well as the infrastructure changes um, will be very helpful to moving this along um, in an aggressive um, but prudent timeline. That's quite an array of expectations to, to meet and, and fulfill. Um, yes. Yeah, an impressive effort. Uh, Licinia, how, do the, the, how does the landscape in San Francisco compare to that of around Baltimore? You mentioned you're in a very urban built up area. What are you hearing from stakeholders and what are the, what are the interests that you have to, to satisfy with your, with your transition? Thanks, Tim. You know, in San Francisco, we always have lots of stakeholders in various directions. Um, I'd say, you know, probably first and foremost, the policymakers, both the members of our, our own, the MTA's board of directors, and then the San Francisco Board of Supervisors have really been trying to address climate issues from many angles. So with fleet electrification, obviously, you know, is a big part of that. But as we started to get really into a detailed look at what the transition will take, um, so one of the things that CARB required was a, a zero emission bus rollout plan, which you know, really gave us an opportunity to kind of dive in and, and, and start to try to sift through all of the 
different layers of details that this was going to require and crafting that document really made us really drill down into you know here's you know uncovering some of the things that are going to be more challenges for us as we pursue the transition um, and so we were able to really sit down with members of our board of directors and and, and work through some of those issues um, before bringing the rollout plan to them for for adoption and um, so I think we really have some great partners uh, in our policy groups um, that will that will work with us moving forward. Um, internally too at the MTA, I mentioned uh, Bhavan Khatri earlier. Um, he's a really great champion for zero emission bus. And I think his uh, overall career trajectory, like this is what he wants to work on. And having somebody like that in the agency, I think is really important. And also the support and kind of general leadership of, of the transit division management team definitely pushes the work forward. I think an internal champion is really uh, sort of necessary. Um, and then in San Francisco, we have a diverse group of climate and electrification advocacy groups who consistently check our work and keep us in line when we're presenting at public hearings, which is important. And then also I think really important to note is how energetically like our, all of us, our consultant partners have stepped up to the plate here to, to assist agencies with this as we kind of take on the general day-to-day -day work of running transit. Um, sometimes it's hard for us to be able to, you know, have the capacity to really look at kind of major shifts in landscape like this. Um, and, and sort of arranged by the consultants and then also as the industry moves forward and conversations and facilitated discussions like the ones we're having today, I think are also really helpful in getting, um, you know, a, a sort of comprehensive understanding of how different agencies are approaching this, which, you know, even though we not, might not necessarily feel like stakeholders to each other, I think um, when, we, when we convene for these kinds of conversations, it definitely, it's definitely the case. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Thanks, Lucinia. Uh, Michael, Lucinia talked a, a little bit about involvement from the board, about having technical champions within the organization and about having uh, environmental interest groups uh, affecting the whole process. What are you finding over at Indigo for involvement of stakeholders with your zero emission bus transition? Um, I would echo a lot of I would echo a lot of what everyone else has said on the panel so far and some of the stakeholders. Um, and but I, I think when you talk about the environmental and the board, the board's been very supportive. The city of Indianapolis has been very supportive. Part of our program of the battery electric buses is um, we're part of the Marion County Transportation Plan. So we're the backbone of the Marion County Transportation Plan for the city of Indianapolis and Lawrence and some other towns and villages that are associated in the county. So uh, there's a lot of involvement uh, from the stakeholders in that, but we've run into, um, your typical stakeholders of some of the businesses because uh, for the BRT itself, you're taking away lanes and doing dedicated lanes. Um, so that has an impact that's a little bit beyond your typical battery electric bus. But um, we also uh, have, I don't know if you call it a stakeholder, but there is one area that we were surprised by, but maybe we shouldn't have been surprised by, but um, we're dealing with the famous Buy America compliance right now on the BYD buses. and there's a certain agency that disagrees that BYD is not fully by American compliant. And so then it falls into the Defense Act, which uh, at the end of this year, if you don't have that 70%, you're not compliant with the by American requirements. And right now, as we're having this conference today, there is in DC a backlash against, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, it's their personal opinions, against China. And so there's all kinds of uh, action going on in DC where you have legislators trying to plug in wording that is, is more restrictive of anything that's not American by American compliance. And I'm not trying to, you know, who versus them, but that's something that we're having to deal with as an agency where we're trying to at least try and find a neutral middle ground where we can still move forward with using the BYD buses because they're a very good bus for us. They work and they serve our purposes and they're getting improving their ranges and stuff. So that's a stakeholder that we weren't quite expecting to have to deal with. And the state of Indiana is um, a red state. The city of Indianapolis is a blue city. And so you have, um, some pushing and pulling literally from the state legislators against our own program. So um, that's another area of stakeholders that we're having to deal with, but that's just open 
you know, transparent conversations and discussions is the best way to deal with that. So we're working through that, but that's the stakeholder we've had to respond to that we didn't necessarily think would be your typical stakeholders. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And uh, I should have mentioned, if anybody wants to chime in, you can either use the raise hand or just make a motion. I'm, I'm, I'm watching everyone. So if you, if you have something you want to add, please feel free. Um, it's interesting to think about, you know, by America, this zero emissions greenhouse gases is a global phenomenon. And the effort to produce zero emission technologies is truly global. We have technology coming from, from every continent, every corner of the globe. Uh, with perhaps accepting Antarctica, but everyone else is participating and that, that does limit choice, right? And that makes this a little bit difficult. We know we have different technologies and zero emissions. We have battery of hydrogen fuel cell. We have different producers, domestic and foreign. We have interests such as labor. We want to increase domestic jobs. And Earl talked about uh, involving trade unions uh, early on in the process. Uh, I'm wondering how you're finding that working out for your options. Are you finding that you have a variety of approaches and options that you can choose from, or you're really just trying to get enough parts and pieces together to get a single approach? Um, are, are you finding availability of the, of the components, of the expertise that you need uh, to provide you with a variety of options, or is it really just trying to get to a single, a single option? Um, Lucinia, I, I see you contemplating. I'm going to pick on you first. Um, how are your options looking and how restricted are you feeling? Sure. So, I mean, again, I'm, I'm going to take this from the facility side. So focusing more on kind of availability of charging equipment and infrastructure and, and how we're trying to deal with, with sort of ongoing evolution of, of components. Um, you know, we are in a position with our with our first big rebuild of, of Petrero Yard that we are we're in procurement now, and so to to be in procurement for a development partner for that, we had to write as prescriptive of a set of technical requirements as we could for this facility. Um, you know, we've been running public transit for over a hundred years. We understand what it takes to build a, a bus maintenance facility. Um, if, you know, in terms of like if we were building it, and this is actually an electric trolley bus facility, so at least, you know, it is already a zero emission facility, but not um, uh, dependent on overhead infrastructure, of course. So, I mean, we know what it takes to, to build a better electric, I mean, I'm sorry, a, a maintenance facility for buses. We can do that. And we know what it takes to maintain the buses and, and to put technical standards in place to, to design bus maintenance bays. Um, employee workspaces, et cetera. Where it becomes a lot more challenging is to write a set of prescriptive requirements for infrastructure that is still evolving. Um, and so essentially what we ended up doing is breaking out the technical requirements sections. You know, here's the entire design criteria document for the bus facility, kind of agnostic of fleet propulsion, which is difficult to do. And then here's a set of um, sort of more performance-based, more qualitative, um, you know, minimum performance standards for charging equipment, sort of trying to put an eye on the future of what we think might come out between now and the time that, uh, that the facility goes under construction, which we hope is 2023. Um, and then beyond that, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, we're charging our development partner with, with the responsibility of, of performing the, the transition of the rest of our fleet to better electric bus over time while the building is in service. And so over that time, over the next you know, decade or so, as our trolley fleet transitions to better electric bus, you know, we'll be asking them to sort of change out the overhead infrastructure that supports the trolley fleet and replace that with sort of a charging pantograph um, that of the future, right? Which we don't really, which we, um, are sort of, you know, really sort of honestly, you know, there's a lot of risk in, in figuring out how to define that right now when we hear on the street that many new things are coming out, but, um, you know, have yet to see them really available for, for integration into the system right now. Yeah, really interesting. Staying flexible on evolving technology by writing specifications that are more performance-based than specifically prescriptive for a specific manufacturer. That's, that's a great approach. Um, Earl, how are things looking over at MDOT and around Baltimore? Are you finding the options that you need? Are you also finding similar challenges with changing technology as you're trying to, to buy it? Well, changing technology on the fly while you're continuing the service that you're required to deliver is always gonna be a challenge. 
we were fortunate in that the Maryland Commission on Climate Change had a legislative responsibility to make recommendations to meet the, the state's 40 by, by 30 law. And in fact, when the final recommendations came out for the Maryland Commission of Climate Change, we have an aspirational goal of 50% reduction from 2006 levels by 2030. Uh, because we had that draft plan a year in advance of the final um, plan going to the governor and the legislature, MTA had the time to undertake a comprehensive zero emission transition study. The purpose of that study was to evaluate the feasibility of converting its four bus divisions to support zero emission buses, understand how compatible the zero emission vehicle ranges with MTA's existing service and scheduling patterns, uh, assess the energy and utility needs considering the electric charges needed for each bus. The study also assessed energy and utility needs, including coordination needed with utility companies. And finally, the study also evaluated costs and funding of the transition, including alternative delivery and how to, to responsibly leverage innovative financing strategy. So the good news was that the study did conclude that we could do 50% to zero emission by 2030. That was achievable, though very costly, um, close to $400 million of additional funding needs over the next 10 years. Um, all bus divisions will need significant electrical power upgrades, including dedicated circuits. Um, I, I think uh, Jesus mentioned that earlier with his organization also, um, that would appropriately service the large scale um, battery electric um, bus service needs. Um, hydrogen fuel cell is only feasible at one of the divisions, as I said earlier, um, due to safety codes for hydrogen storage. Um, we're looking for M.MTA to fully rebuild our eastern uh, bus division as a purpose-built battery electric bus facility with an expanded footprint. Um, and, and also the neighborhood that that bus is in is one of those neighborhoods where we really do need to lower our carbon footprint. Um, and also key cost components are capital costs to retrofit and rebuild these facilities, um, support ZEV charging and maintenance needs, as well as increased vehicle and training costs. I think I talked to you about the, the labor challenges earlier. We believe that one, the lower cost part of this is that we believe the, the operating and maintenance costs are gonna go down due to lower fuel costs and lower maintenance needs once the technology matures to where we expect it to be um, moving forward as we go through the decade. Sure. Yeah. Um, we're, we're looking to see, hopefully, those kind of cost improvements across the board, across all components of this. Um, Michael, um, you know, Earl talked a little bit about using consultants and using a transition plan to kind of help guide that technology selection. Um, at Indigo, have you been able to, to leverage some consultants for transition planning to help with some of those restricted choice uh, problems that you had mentioned before? Um, yeah, uh, yes, we have. Um, and in full disclosure, I actually am a program manager here at Indigo as the capital project director, and I'm actually, uh, I work for HTTP, so I'm a consultant in the program management role, but we also have been working with WSP, and WSP has done a really good job on the electrification studies and analysis for our infrastructure, um, because that's been a key issue um, before we even did the um, early, when we were starting the whole battery electric bus fleet, they helped us analyze, did we even need to add a substation or not at the headquarters for Indigo? Um, luckily, Indianapolis has a long history of having a lot of auto manufacturing here in the city. And so they had a pretty strong grid uh, and capacity. Um, and in fact, we're in the um, Duesenberg, a historic factory building is where our headquarters is located here. So um, bottom line is, yeah, we do take advantage of using the consultants and they're able to help um, transition over and do some of the analysis and the studies that are needed while we're still trying to run the buses on a daily basis and keep the electric buses on the route and keeping hitting those headways that we need to on our BRG system itself. Great, thanks, Michael. Um, Jess, I'll hit you up last on this point and then we'll, we'll go to a new area. Um, you mentioned that LA Metro jumped right into doing two BRT lane uh, routes with uh, en route charging. Um, how have you found your ability to, to specify, find the equipment that you need to fix your technology path as you move forward, despite changing uh, competitive landscapes, changing technology as you move? That's a great question. Um, we found, so what we did is, is uh, in our approach for the BRTs, we put out 
a performance-based specification where we said we were going to be agnostic uh, to the approach, but we wanted the, appro the approach to be able to um, support the intended service on, on each of the BRTs. And so we got some proposals that said uh, we can run out there using depot chargers only. Uh, and we got another approach that said we can support service with a combination of low range buses, but with en route chargers. Uh, and and uh, and as we went through it, we recognized that that uh, that the technology had not yet matured enough to provide reliable um, reliability with either approach. Uh, and uh, so as we as we started getting into it, we, we uh, for example, the, the people that recommended the uh, the en route chargers they had a uh, proprietary approach. Uh, and so did the other one had a proprietary approach. At the end of the day, we had to uh, do a lot of tweaking to make sure that that, uh, that we started being more prescriptive in some parts of it, where we said, okay, we have to use a standard charging uh, um, system for both the plug-in and the overhead charging. And uh, so, so, with lessons learned, uh, we had to uh, start dictating some of the things to make sure that we had long-term integration. Um, and so, and so, right now, the orange line is working fairly well. Right now, we did have some integration issues between the charging equipment uh, and the uh, and the vehicles. Uh, and again, it's in the interface. It was it was it was just thankfully just software, and they were firmware, and they were able to take care of that. But but it was because we paid a lot of attention to that part of it at the beginning. Uh, on the silver line, uh, the approach that that uh, that we got there, the, the the original claim was they could do everything with just en route charging. Uh, but and and again with their own um, proprietary approach for charging. Uh, but but as, as we started getting into it, we saw that the, those buses had nowhere near the reliable range for that. Uh, so you, at the end of the day, so that's why we added uh, a depot charging as a requirement for a silver line. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's it's you, you you do a lot of learning as you go through it, and and you just have to be very flexible. Um, but you you have to avoid the finger pointing at the end of the day. Uh, everyone's learning, uh, so you know. And so you just, at the end of the day, you want the project to be successful. So you just have to support everyone at the end of the day. You're not, you're, the project's not gonna be successful unless the contractors are also successful. Um, going back to, to the previous question though, on the use of consultants, there's two areas where we have really, really, really found the consultants to be helpful. One of them was in the energy management. Uh, we, we put a tremendous amount of, of, of energy months and months into trying to optimize uh, the energy management to reduce the peak power from, from say 18 to 10. That was, that was huge for us and that's paying off dividends now as, 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 as we plan some of the conversions. The other one that really helped is, is in the phasing plan, how, how we're going to do, do this work, you know, because say for example, right now we have three megawatts of power available. Well, let's use that. So, so some of the divisions we're we're going to be converting it in three stages. You know, stage one is is uh, is um, putting service out with the available power that we have. Stage two is is we start adding power. Uh, and uh, and so the consultants have really helped us uh, uh, develop a phasing plan for each of the divisions in our whole system. Uh, so so that's the. the we, that's been very helpful for us. Fantastic. Yeah, uh, that gives a nice transition for our lightning round. We have just a few minutes left. So uh, this is a big question, and this is one we could spend an entire session on. Uh, it has to do with uh, surety of supply of energy or fuel for your buses. Uh, we know in California, public safety power shutoffs are a reality that have to do with the fire season and shutting down parts of the grid. 
to avoid fire dangers. Also on the East Coast, we've had hurricane events. We have real winters that happen there. And in Indianapolis, same thing. You know, a bad ice storm can shake out the grid for for considerable amount of time. So I want to hit each of you in the time we have left for what are your what are your strategies and approaches for ensuring continuous supply, even in hydrogen, you know, you can do production on site, you can do delivered gas, delivered liquid, there are a lot of different options for electricity, you can do the same thing, you can produce on site, you can get uh, uh, PPA through your utility, you can do it through an independent power provider, lots of options out there, what are you doing to ensure surety of, of energy or fuel supply for your buses, and I see Michael just took his mute off, so I'm going to hit him first, uh, what are you doing in, at Indigo? Um, so we do have solar panels, about 4,000 or 300 solar powers on our actual maintenance base that that does provide up to 70 megawatts uh, over a month. So we are able to utilize that. And then we're looking into a long term, uh, the wind option, a wind power. We have a lot of wind farms in Indiana. So that's not going to solve all the problems, but it's just like the whole electric vehicle industry. It's, I think it's a mix of different alternative fuels and the hydrogen fuel cell, we're looking into that as well, but we want to make sure that it's not the dirty hydrogen fuel cell production. So that's how we're looking at it moving forward. So we're not wedded to, it's just got to be battery. It could be fuel cell down the road as well. So that's how we're approaching that. Great. Earl, how are you looking at things at MDOT for energy security? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll answer that question um, three different ways. Um, one way is, again, MDOT and Maryland Transit Administration, we're an agency of the state of Maryland. Um, we're fortunate the Maryland Public Service Commission has been fairly active and aggressive regarding um, moving forward with programs to pilot transition of vehicles in the state to uh, electric um, recharging. Um, there's actually a five-year electric um, vehicle pilot program uh, that's providing significant resources and allowing the utilities to provide EV recharging services. But there's also a companion program that the PSC is working on related to energy storage. So there's some state level activity regarding uh, how we can deploy um, energy storage as that technology continues to mature. Another is uh, similar to what Michael just said, you know, we are looking at one of our divisions at fuel cells to have some diversity um, range on site storage. Um, also, again, our, our, our migration plan is 50% by 2030, but 95% by 2045. And the reason why it's already only 95% is that we may need to keep a small percentage of our fleet with some type of fossil type fuel or liquid type fuel, because we have a, a state responsibility to help with emergency evacuations, for instance, a hurricane comes up a coast and there's folks that don't have a way to get out of Ocean City on the Eastern Shore. And we have had to deploy um, our buses before to help with evacuations. So in cases where you may have a situation where the power grid is down and you need to do multiple trips of your buses to move people out of harm's way, you need to have some flexibility with a small percent of your fleet. So that gets back to the diversity of fuel issue. So uh, hopefully that, that helps answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jess, I see you're ready to speak. At LA Metro, what are you looking at to ensure security of energy supply for your buses? So when we're designing our, our divisions, we're looking at making sure we have multiple circuits. So if a case one circuit fails, another circuit should be available electrical from the grid. That's one. So we're looking at redundancy and, and, and in our circuit. The other thing that we're looking at is in case of a catastrophic event, we know that the expectation is not to provide 100% of service, but rather service for first responders. So that would be approximately about 20% of, of existing. Uh, and uh, so, so that will be our focus during times of emergency. Uh, we're also looking at on-site energy storage, and we're also looking at having uh, generators uh, at uh, key locations throughout our region. Um, but, but I really like what Earl mentioned a little while ago is, uh, in case of very specific events, we have to take a look at evacuations and, and that might be a couple of hundred miles depending on, on, on a type of, so, so I'm glad you brought that, I'm glad to put that on my, uh, 
I'm like, pleased to 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 confirm we're 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 good with. Great, and uh, we're just a little bit over, but Lucinia, can you wrap us up? What are you doing in San Francisco to look at keeping that hetch hetchy electricity flowing? <laughs> Sure, yeah. I mean, a lot of the things Earl said are right front of mind for us. We also have a regional uh, response uh, role for wildfire, and et cetera. So that's, we're definitely looking at, you know, what do we do if we go all electric in the event of a larger um, outage? We are, we're kind of framing ours in sort of three different buckets. One being like for blips or outages of seconds, we're looking at ways that we can ensure that our systems recover and restart without requiring an actual human to like go to the panel and flip a switch. So that's one. And then we have kind of in the outages of minutes category, we're looking at kind of re redundant capacity, roof mounted solar, on site battery storage, which is obviously an industry that's also really rapidly evolving. And we hope to see much better storage capacities um, in the next few years. And then for hours to days, we are still, as others said, you know, working with traditional sort of diesel powered backup generators um, and trying to keep the door open for greener solutions as they come onto the market. Fantastic. All right, well, we're over time. Thank you one and all to this great panel. You all are in the thick of it and we're all very appreciative that you're getting us to zero emissions. And I look forward to catching up next year to see how it's going.